Great, thank you. So with that, I'd like to introduce our topic today, uh, rental housing. It's a topic I'm sure that's interesting to everybody on the call today, obviously you're on the call, but it's also important to about uh, to all of British Columbians, and in particular, there's uh, 30% of our households, which are uh, renter households in the province. And in urban communities, this is even higher. Uh, we see Vancouver with uh, 52% of uh, people renting, and in Victoria, 60%. And it's, uh, it's a kind of a common trend across the province. Uh, urban areas have higher rental uh, than the rural areas. In 2012, BC Nonprofit Housing Association conducted a study and I think their findings were quite interesting. They found that um, they predict the rental demand over the next 25 years to increase quite a bit by between 27 and 36 percent, depending on uh, you know the variables there. But what was really interesting about the study was uh, where they see the rental uh, demand increasing, and that's with our aging society. They see really a lot of seniors moving out of single-family dwellings and into the rental housing market. And I think that raises a number of interesting issues for, for us. It, you know, there's probably two I can think of right away, and that's, you know, what do we do with this large, uh, you know, existing rental housing stock that we have, and how do we make that stock more accessible for people that are going to be needing it over the next 25 years? And the second question is more of a, a design question for and build question for developers and communities that are encouraging new rental housing supply, and what needs to be done to that supply to make it really work for uh, a new demographic of renters that are coming online. So I know that uh, obviously you're on here because you care about rental housing, and many communities do as well. I think uh, it's fair to say that uh, in the housing policy branch, we have the opportunity to look at a lot of you know, reports, plans, studies that are done by different municipalities, uh, local governments, and, you know, and other folks. And I would say probably the top three issues always focus on rental housing in, in every one of these studies or reports. And uh, that's over the last decade. And I'd say probably in the last year or two, the studies that we've seen have really focused on rental housing as being the number one issue. And if I look at the, the kind of issues that really come up, once again, it's what do we do with this uh, existing rental housing stock? A lot of people are looking at how to preserve that, uh, but at the same time, how to invest new money and see that stock redeveloped. But also with the, the, the issue of how to keep those rents affordable, to not displace people or long-term tenants that were in that housing, and still provide it at an affordable rate. I think the other issue really is, uh, uh, is, is uh, how to build in this different uh, rental housing market. We haven't seen a lot of construction in uh, you know, 20, 30 years of uh, new purpose-built rental housing. I think we're starting to see a little bit of that come back online, but the market really changed uh, a long time, or about 20, 30 years ago, and so we're now uh, local governments are coming up with some really interesting, innovative solutions. Uh, the development community is really, really rethinking the business models and how to make it work. So I'm really happy today that we have two different speakers that can provide a, their own unique perspectives on that. Uh, the first speaker will be providing a local government perspective and I think talking about a, a whole range of tools and you know how they've worked and not worked in their community. And the second speaker is a developer who's going to talk about their real on-the-ground experience of doing both. Uh, you know, restoration of existing and the construction of new. So with that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Sav Grieve. She is the uh, current Director of Development Services for the City of New Westminster. Uh, she oversees planning, building, and business license and enforcement. And she has a long-standing interest in growth management, uh, housing policy, and sustainable development. Uh, those of who have been following Sav's career will know that she was also a senior planner at Metro Vancouver and a housing planner with the city of Burnaby. She's also, uh, she also teaches a course uh, in housing and community sustainability at the Simon Fraser University. And I'm sure for the planners in the room, uh, many of you have had the opportunity to take this course if you've been to Simon Fraser University. And I know uh, my boss this morning, uh, Greg Steves, was talking about uh, the course he took many years ago at, with Bev, who encouraged him to get into uh, planning and also into the field of housing. Uh, she holds a master's degree in urban planning from uh, the University of British Columbia. So uh, over with that, I'd like to pass it over to Bev Greaves, who's going to talk about uh, New Westminster's secured market rental housing policy. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Great. Hi, everybody. And um, first, I'd, li I'd like to say that Greg was an excellent student and <laughs> back in the day, and with him was Leanne Garnett, who very well might be with us today. So my two-star students were doing great, great work. 
Thank you so much. And I'm really pleased to present the local government perspective on this important issue. I think it's – now I have to figure out where my slides are. I see them. Okay, just for a technical thing, to find my slides. That's uh, the blue arrows in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen there, Bev. Bottom left-hand corner. One goes up, one goes down, and there's a, an 8 of 69 beside it. Got it. Perfect. There We're on go. our way. For those of you that may not be familiar with the City of New Westminster, because I know our audience might be across Canada today, which is fantastic. The City of New Westminster is located in the, in the geographic center of Metro Vancouver. It's actually quite a small um, city. We're 15 square kilometers in area, and our current population is almost 66,000 people. I think what's really interesting about um, the City of New Westminster is that it's the, it's the oldest municipality this side of the Great Lakes, and um, it was actually the first capital um, of the province of BC, and um, I think, you know, some days, you know, some of us wish we still were the capital of the province of BC. But it's an interesting place. It's a small, it's a small area, but it has all the opportunities and challenges of the large city. The issue of rental housing, I think, for the city of New Westminster, has always been a really important issue for us. We know that a supply of a, of a secure and robust stock of rental housing is important for the social diversity of the, of the city, but also the economic health. I think as planners, we all know how important it is to have a diverse housing stock in terms of tenure and types to meet the needs of people. But increasingly, we're finding that um, a, a housing stock that meets the needs of employees, of a range of employees, is important to attract employers. And we're at the point in our development where, uh, you know, attracting really interesting in, in, in employers and um, business opportunities is, is really at the top of our agenda. So why is rental housing important? And I'm going to throw a few stats at you, but hopefully uh, to, to give a picture of what we're like. Currently, renter households represent 44% of the households in New Westminster, and actually that's a bit of a decrease. It actually was closer to 50% not that long ago. Like all places in Metro Vancouver, we have a persistently low vacancy rate. Right now it's 1.6%. And it really, really has been in that range between 1% to 2% for the last 20 years. It hasn't changed much. As we all know, renter households have um, a much lower income than, than um, owner households. It it's, um, usually ranges about half. But we know in order to meet, um, to meet the needs of renter households, we have to actually take into account affordability. And through this, um, I will... I will give you some examples of how we are, we are addressing the issue of affordability in the rental housing stock. There we go. So why is rental housing important and who is it serving? I think Roger gave a great example about how rental housing is serving the needs of our aging population, that not only do seniors find that they have, that they move into rental housing, to be in locations that are more suitable for their own needs, but sometimes they move into rental housing to, to um, release some equity in their households to, to pay for the, their health care costs as they get older. In the city of New Westminster, we're increasingly finding that families um, are in need of rental housing, particularly new Canadians. Uh, we, um, as um, a companion piece of work, we're doing a, a family-friendly housing policy and we did actually quite an extensive survey of the housing needs of families, and rental housing came up as number one. It was, um, it was quite amazing, and that one may, may be another webinar in the future. Another group, and I think John's going to talk to this, is the, the millennials or the young people. Um, millennials are increasingly are looking to locations that are close to transit. Um, often they do not drive cars, or they don't even have driver's licenses. And they want to live in affordable housing or rental housing so that they can, you know, spend um, their money on things such as building their careers, accessing education. Um, in the case of um, these three, three young men, they chose to um, live in a shared accommodation, and um, their challenge has been to find secure, a secure three-bedroom apartment that's close to transit. 
And for those of you in the city of in the city of Burnaby, um, they found that the Burnaby Heights area is where they have ended up in three different apartments over their their career and now um, their career as um, in their new business as young filmmakers. Why is rental housing stock important to the city of New Westminster? I think this is probably true of all um, cities in the Metro Vancouver region, but our rental housing inventory is aging. As you can see in the graph, there's very few units that were built out after 1970, and as I think John will also point out, is after the 1970s, there's been very few government um, programs or incentives to build rental housing. So the first, so the, the latest um, interest in rental housing is um, meant to help replace the stock as it ages, um, and also I think you know some of this is, is through a, an economic climate that that finally is creating a is, is setting the table so new rental housing stock can be built. The question that often that people often say to us is. Yes, you know, we know that replacing the rental housing stock is important, but what about the secondary rental housing market? Isn't that really filling the needs um, of the rental housing market? And, you know, there's, there's truth to that, that there is a real role for rental, rented condominiums and secondary suites, which really comprise the secondary rental market. Um, and, um, we, you know, that is acknowledged, but we also know that these forms of housing have their challenges. I think we all know people that have been in rented condominiums where they find the owner is coming back in and they lose their housing. Um, and and rented, rental condominiums have an, often an extra set of costs that are passed on to the renters that arise from things such as strata fees. So in many ways, they're not as secure as what we call purpose-built rental housing. The same with secondary suites. Secondary suites are are an, an essential part of the rental housing market, and particularly for people that want that ground orientation. But again, it likely does not pri provide the level of security that purpose-built rental housing has. With this in mind, the city felt that looking at, um, at the, the issue of, uh, of the pressures on our secured rental housing stock was an important, was a, it, Certainly it was um, considered one of the probably two most important policy issues in the city, this and, and um, truck traffic, by the way, if you're wondering what the other one was. So what the city did is it, it, is it, um, it did quite a bit of research on the issue of market rental housing and developed a new strategy. So the intent of this policy is to increase the supply of market rental housing and ensure the security of tenure over time. So the key issue, the key um, point is increasing the supply. Um, secondly, um, the city looked at incentives to encourage the development of the rental housing stock. And um, it was meant to encourage development by the private sector without senior government subsidy. So really what this policy in, tries to do is reduce the gap between what rental projects can pay for land and what strata projects can pay for land. Certainly since the 1970s, there's, you know, there's um, good evidence that condominium projects were able to outbid, uh, outbid land um, as compared to rental housing, which made the development of rental housing very, very difficult. So really the goal of this policy is to add to the, um, the inventory of rental housing in the long term. So our policy was adopted in May 2013. There, there it is. And it's available on our website. Well, here we go. What does, the, what does the policy say? What I'm going to do right now is go through the tools, and then I'm going to show you examples of how they were implemented. The first tool that we have is the use of density bonusing for rental housing. In our zoning bylaw, we have, we, we, under various multifamily zones, we have two um, levels of density. One is the base density, and second, is the bonus density or the extra density. And there's essentially two ways that one can get the extra density. One is to pay for it, or secondly, to build secured market rental housing with no payment. So this was, so the goal of this policy is to give that extra benefit, that extra density for rental housing. The second is to reduce parking requirements. And finally, we provide what we call the half-price building permit fees. 
which is a small incentive, but um, you know, in our mind, all of these things do add up to make um, rental housing viable. Some of the other incentives are to improve the process and the development process for um, rental housing. Um, the city covers the cost of the legal document preparation, and um, we relax some of the city servicing requirements where it makes sense. With regards to the rental housing, um, to the legal document preparation, we worked really closely with our solicitors at Young Anderson, and um, there's a solicitor named Jay Lancaster who has really seized this file and helped, has helped us develop, I think, now 10 um, housing agreements. So th that has been fantastic. So the three strategic directions in our policy are, first, the retention of the existing rental housing stock. Secondly, the renewal of the rental housing stock. And finally, enhancements to the stock. And I will go through all three of these and show real life examples. The results to date have actually been remarkable. The simple objective was to increase the supply of new rental housing stock and, um, and through construction and renovation to the existing stock to increase its life. There's been incredible interest. And um, as of now, we have over a thousand new units under, constru or under construction or in the last phases of the development approvals process. So the first strategic direction is retaining the existing rental housing stock. This, in my mind, speaks to the affordability. What this council said is that we want to ensure that we hang on to that really important older rental housing stock as long as we can. So what this council has said that, um, to um, the development community is that generally if there is an existing rental housing um, building on a site, that, that's not the area um, that, um, that redevelopment or rezoning is encouraged, that there's plenty of other sites in the city that can be developed um, without resulting in the demolition of an apartment building. So what we do is we steer developers to other sites that do not involve the demolition of rental housing. However, in some cases, due to the, uh, due to the condition of the building, that there may be demolition. And in this case, we look for a, um, an enhanced tenant relocation and, and replacement housing options. And this may include uh, actions beyond what's required in the Rental, rental Tenancy um, Act, or it um, it may be replacing some of those units in the development. Luckily, we've had very few examples of this. Of this, We have um, one right now that isn't related to the expansion of a, of a school. But given, uh, given the number of sites that we have to redevelop that do not involve the demolition of the rental housing stock, this, um, this policy has actually done quite well. And the, the rationale behind this policy is that the most affordable housing is the stock that is already there. And that's a quote from David Holchansky, who was certainly my professor um, back in planning school. What council, or our council has, a, has um, strongly told the community is we believe that the housing stock, the rental housing stock that's there now is the most, is the most affordable stock. And it's up to the city to ensure that it stays um, available as long as possible. The second strategic direction is to renew that rental housing stock. What we want to do is increase investment in those existing buildings to increase the, and to increase the, the lifespan of that stock. And we also in, want to improve the operating costs of that housing wherever we can. So in this case, those of us in local government often find situations where there's a, an old apartment building and maybe the basement, maybe the old lockers were converted illegally into a suite. Under this policy, um, using our density bonus provision, and what we're saying to the owners is rather than take that suite out, we're saying let's consider legalizing that suite. Uh, it has to be brought up to the building code um, the standards, and we, we do deal with livability issues. But, you know, but um, we, we want to make sure that the density is available, that that suite can be legalized. And this actually has been used now quite a few times. The building code allows us to use alternative standards. And um, in a situation I will show you, the, um, the building inspector, the chief building inspector, required that the new unit be sprinkler. But um, he viewed that the improvement, that, that the rest of the, the building could be as it was. Under this, we eliminate any parking requirements for the new suite, 
and we also give um, give the lower price building permit. Through our energy, um, our community energy efficiency program, we're also looking at these buildings as being uh, amongst the first to receive benefit in terms of upgrades for to to the energy efficiency of the buildings. So when the city does have a few grants and a few tools, these are the buildings we want to focus on. So I promised a real-life example. Crown Manor is an apartment building that's owned by Metro Vancouver Housing Corporation. And they um, found themselves with half the basement being empty. It was, a, it was essentially a storage room that had never been used. So they approached the city and said, look it, we would like to put a suite. We'd like to put a family-oriented suite in, in that spot. <clears throat> now, they did not have the density, nor did they, you know, and they were actually under part for this building. Through this policy, we, we worked with Metro Vancouver, and um, in this corner here, in the site plan, in the very corner, you'll see a hatched area. And in that hatched area, they have provided, or they have now built a two-bedroom suite. And through the various tools, it, um, it is a legal suite and um, is, you know, providing an affordable housing for a family. Now, this is, there's two parts of this which I think are important. One is these tools can be used for um, nonprofit housing as well as market housing. And, and you know, <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, and secondly, you know, it, it is it is a small increase to the housing stock. You know, it's one unit. But looking you know, down the road, we know there's many, there's hundreds of buildings in the city where this kind of action could be taken. There we are. Another example is the Telford block. One of the, the tools that this city uses quite um, generously is the Heritage Revitalization Agreement. And one of the buildings is the Telford Block, which is just located outside the downtown. And it was actually an old rooming house. So in this case, um, we used the Heritage Revitalization Agreement to allow 11 market rental units. And, um, and um, they're all bachelor units and a two-bedroom unit. Through the HRA, the Heritage Revitalization Agreement, we actually can do variances to just about everything to the parking. So. So this um, project is now under construction, and there's some drawings of what it looks like. There we are. And uh, there was a relaxation to parking as in no parking, but it's located quite close to SkyTrain. So finally, the third strategic direction is the enhancements to the, the secured rental housing stock. And there's three categories that we, uh, that we, we developed. One is short term. Housing and the theory, or the, the philosophy behind this, is the the greater length of security, the, the larger the, the number of incentives. So for um, buildings where they're guaranteed for minimum of 10 years and that are stratified, they have to be held and managed by one entity. And there's only a few incentives we use in this case, and that's um, speeding up the processing of the rezoning and building permit application, and we pay the legal fees for the housing agreement. We have one of these, and it was done by Aragon in the Port Royal area. <clears throat> the second example is the medium-term uh, rental housing stock. So in these cases, the, the buildings are guaranteed for rental between 30 and 59 years. There's some flexibility on stratification, meaning that the buildings may be stratified with covenants put on. And again, the units are managed by one entity. So in addition to the incentives you saw before, in this case, we consider a reduction in re the required parking, uh, especially for those, for those projects that, that are located on the frequent transit network or close to a SkyTrain station. And I have an example of that. Again, in Queensboro at 300 Sulster Street in the Port Royal area, the project you see here, one of the buildings is a, um, a condominium building, and the building on the left is a rental building. And what was nice about this project, which is guaranteed rental for 40 years, is that the units are actually quite large, so they're helping to meet the need for our family-friendly housing. Finally, and this is a category where we're getting the most interest and the most traction, is the long-term rental housing stock. In this case, the buildings are guaranteed rental for 60 years or the life of the building. There um, is restrictions on stratification. Now, I'm going to go back to that point in very, short, in very shortly. It's really it's one of the lessons we've learned. It should be owned and managed by one entity. 
So in addition to the incentives that you saw previously, in this case is where we offer the increase in density offered through a density bonus or um, if, there's need, if there is need for rezoning. There is a reduction to the building permit fees and um, there is an automatic reduction in required parking and payment in lieu, uh, the payment in lieu policy. So in these cases, the zoning bylaw itself has a reduction in the parking, which means that um, the, the, the developer can come in, they know exactly um, what the reduction will be. It makes it actually quite simple and painless. And that um, amendment to our zoning bylaw to reduce the parking was actually adopted a few months ago. And, and in this case, we, we're more, um, we're, we give greater consideration to redu reducing the um, servicing requirements. So some real life examples. One is, the, is at 508 Agnes Street in our downtown and it's the old Mason's Hall. This again is a heritage revitalization agreement. Uh, there is 151 units. They've been, they are not strata titled and they're guaranteed rental for 60 years of the life of the building. There's reduced parking, reduced build, building permit fees, and um, of course we paid for the housing agreement. And this is what it looks like. The Wills Perkins, Wills Perkins Architectural Building. And how this worked is um, the building that I'm showing you here is the old Mason's um, Hall. It's considered a very, very important um, heritage building in the city. And in this development, they actually retained a fair chunk of that building. Um, it wasn't just the facade, it was quite a bit more. Um, and on the site, they, they built um, the new rental housing. Um, and um, it, this one is actually going for approval next Monday. Um, so we're quite excited by it. It was quite well received in our downtown area. Another project is 900 Carnarvon Street. Some of you may know the Plaza 88 development by the new West Sky train station. There's three towers there and a mall. This is the fourth tower. This has actually been an interesting project and, and certainly without controversy, I have to say that. It's 396 units. Um, most of the units are quite small. 25% of the units, or sorry, 50% of the units are 350 square feet. In this case, they received um, benefits in terms of extra density, reduced parking requirements, um, reduced servicing requirements, the, the package. Uh, the, the debate on this was uh, about the number of small units, um, and there we go. There's a picture of it. And I think, John, when you look at this compared to the building you're doing, it, it actually, you gave me some ideas. Okay, next one, and this is the one that's most, is far, most, um, is developed along much farther than the rest of the project. It's on 6th Street, again in our downtown, and it's um, quite close to a SkyTrain station. 282 units, we, we provided reduced parking requirements, extra density, um, again city legal agreements, and it's not stratified and guaranteed for 60 years. And there's a picture of the building. As you can see that there are some commercial on the bottom, there's actually townhouse development on the base, and the tower above. So that's right on 6th Street, which is um, it, it's part of our, our shopping area in the downtown. This one also is going for final approval on Monday as well, and the developer is quite keen to begin construction. Okay, so the question that I'm also asked is what is the value of those incentives? So we've been playing around with that, and what I can tell you is um, in the city of New Westminster, we value the extra density in our downtown about $20 per square foot buildable. So um, a building not unlike of the one that I just showed you, that's about $2 million in density that, the, that um, would be provided at no cost. The building permit fee reduction is about $120,000. And the savings in parking is, is the most significant part of this. If we as a ballpark figure, if we figure that it costs about $25,000 per parking stall, um, in, in a case of 100 stalls, it's, you know, it's, it's two and a half million dollars. So really, the parking cost is, is one of the most significant um, benefits or, to this. So some of us, let's move on to some of our lessons learned. Oh, first thing, the process and legal documents. In, um, 
if, if a project does require zoning, um, and many of them do because they do want to go higher, they want to break through that height requirement, this is what a typical process looks like. Um, after going through lots and lots of consultation, because after all it's New Westminster, a zoning bylaw is finally introduced. And as part of that um, introduction, we, we present for council what we call principles for the housing agreement. And what these are are the, are the basic um, principles that both the city and the developer have agreed to. A public hearing is held. After that, a um, housing agreement and how, um, is considered by council. And then after that, it's um, housing agreement and the covenants are registered and the zoning is approved. Now, there's two kinds of covenants that tend to go with these. In, um, in, if, in the case of buildings that are stratified, we put on a no separate sales covenant, meaning that, um, that the building is stratified and at some point um, there may be an interest in year 41 or year 51 to sell them individually. And at that point, the covenant would come off that um, a no separate sales covenant essentially prevents the, um, the units from being sold separately. And, it's, and this is actually one of our lessons, which I'll come back to. The other covenant, by the way, is the no, um, is the no stratification covenant. And in the, case, the cases of our long-term rental housing, what they say is that the, the building cannot be stratified, that it has to stay as a, as a purpose-built market rental housing development. And the good news we found is that most developers that want to do rental housing really want to do rental housing, that they're willing to um, not stratify it, um, and, uh, and they move forward. And I have to say there's some simplicity to that. One of the lessons that we've learned from this um, and working with our friends at the Land Title Office is that the covenants are important tools, but um, they're not strong tools. And the concern is, for example, with a building that's strata titled with a no separate sales covenant, that um, it really is up to the land title office to ensure that the buildings, the units are not sold separately. And that's a lot of um, a lot of pressure, a lot of you know, a lot of influence to give to the to the land title office. Um, and um, with our discussions with the city of Vancouver, I think many of us are, are not comfortable that that um, authority is is passed on to, to really an agency where this really isn't their business. And because of that, increasingly we're saying to developers, we do want these buildings to not be stratified, and we do want them to be secured for 60 years. And you know, given the value of the incentives being offered, um, it, you know, it's been a reasonable, it's been a reasonable request, and, and the, the developers who want to do rental housing are quite happy to, to work with that. Well, certainly that was one of our lessons. We've had strong pressure to create small units. Um, and, and this actually has resulted in, in the creation of our family-friendly housing policy. Now, this is not to say that if a great project comes in and it's in a, in a location close to transit or SkyTrain, that we're not going to look at micro suites or that kind of project. We absolutely are, and we welcome them. Especially, uh, you know, we, um, we're excited about those that are well-designed. Uh, in this, um, there has been some pressure to loosen some of our urban design criteria, and you know we, we've made it very clear that um, the urban design is important, the public ground treatment is important. In some cases, um, the rental housing was seen as a way to get support for marginal projects. And again, when it comes to things such as the public realm, um, you know, the urban design, these are still incredibly important. As I mentioned, the increased density and the parking relaxations are the most important incentives. And we also recognize that senior government involvement will be needed to enhance affordability of the new stock. Uh, it, and you know, we know that in some cases that the, the residents are um, able to, to access some, some rent supplements through BC Housing. The way the city looks at this is that the rental housing, we're creating a rental housing stock for the next 100 years. That yes, it may not be um, as affordable as the existing stock on year one or year five, but on year 10 or year 15, it will be. So we are taking a long-term view in terms of affordability. Okay, advice. Uh, our advice to anyone looking at this is to to focus on buildings that are not strata titled. The incentives are generous. Um, the units, that, and 
one of the lessons we did learn working actually with people at the province is that it's really difficult to create a building where there's a mix of strata title and rental units. Um, that are, and yet, especially if the rental units are held in one strata lot, because it creates really awkward voting arrangements where a block of, say, 20 rental units has one vote, where um, five um, strata title units have five votes. So you can see the, the, the dynamic there. It's really challenging. And again, I noted there's risk with the no separate sales covenant for strata title projects. We're almost there. So our policy actually received recognition from our peers, and we were thrilled that we received the silver award um, from PIBC for this policy last year. That was, um, that was a wonderful event. And um, I thank you very much for listening to this. There's, I know a lot of technical information in this, and please feel free to contact me if you want more information about, um, about our policy and some of the tools that um, we've been using. Thank you very much for that presentation, Bev. And uh, I'm particularly thrilled that you talked about uh, the secondary rental market just a little bit at the beginning. And I know we're not going to be able to really talk a lot about that on this particular webinar, but I think it's a, a good topic for a future uh, webinar series. And I'm really uh, grateful, actually, that you went into quite a bit of detail. I think the planning community out there really appreciates um, kind of more of a detailed analysis of how the tools are used and how they come together. Um, at this point, we'll just take a question or two. Um, I have one from the city of Gibsons here. Uh, Bev, this is about uh, the budget process in your community. When you're, uh, you know, drafting up the budget uh, for the municipality, do you actually uh, include uh, the money required to discount uh, fees and legal costs that you provide? Okay. In terms of the legal costs is included in our, in our budget for le under the legal costs, which in, in our case is, is one group. The good news about the legal costs is that because we've developed precedents, it's actually quite low, and my guess right now is the cost of doing the housing agreements is probably under a thousand dollars. It's um, it's really really come down, so that's the good news. In terms of the other benefits, is that the density bonus, the increase in density, is um, you know, it's not in our minds foregone revenue that um, it, we don't put that part into our budget. So the only other cost that we have is a reduction in in the building permit fees. Um, and we do take that into account in, in budgeting the revenue. We, we have, um, you know, a year ahead, we have a pretty darn good guess what projects are coming in and what the, the fees would look like. So our revenue projections, say for our building permits, would reflect that. Okay, well, thanks for that. I've got another couple of questions here from Victoria and uh, Kamloops, but in the interest of time, uh, we're just going to go to John's presentation, and we'll bring those questions back at the end of his presentation. So with that, I'd like to introduce our second speaker today, uh, John Stovall. Uh, he has been in the real estate, real estate investment uh, development industry for over 25 years. Uh, his work, he's worked in all areas, including acquisition, finance, civic approval, construction, and marketing. Uh, for the past 25 or 20 years, he's served as a general manager, and he's now the president of Reliance Properties Limited, which is located in the Gastown area of Vancouver. Reliance is a, a privately owned Vancouver-based company. It's been active in the development, ownership, and management of a wide variety of commercial and residential real estate for over 50 years. He has developed a broad-based expertise in portfolio management, uh, with an emphasis on urban renewal through restoration and renovation of heritage buildings, together with new strata and rental residential and specialty office and retail projects. Uh, the firm has, er has earned several uh, awards for its contribution to the retention of heritage buildings, high-rise excellence, and affordable housing in the downtown, uh, gas town, and downtown east side areas. Uh, he has completed or is currently managing the development over, of over a billion dollars uh, of new development, construction, and renovation projects, in addition to managing an investment portfolio in excess of $600 million in value. Uh, in 2013, uh, the, business, the BC Business Magazine recognized uh, Reliance for its innovative work uh, on the Burns Block Microloss project. And so with that, I'd just like to hand it over to John to talk about uh, Reliance and their rental housing development. Thank you. And uh, can everybody hear me? I'm coming in. Yep. 
Um, so thank you for the introduction, and uh, it was great to hear uh, Deb's uh, presentation. There's a lot of analog uh, in uh, in what's happening in New West with uh, with some of the uh, challenges and and incentive programs that are available in Vancouver. Uh, I think in Vancouver, which is where our primary focus is, we have you know everything is very similar to our other municipalities in terms of the issues, but everything is just kind of more intense and more um, uh, magnified in terms of, of costs and, and uh, approval processes and so on. So um, a little bit about the line properties, and some of that is covered in the bio, thank you. Um, most importantly in, uh, in this is uh, our, our recent uh, work in, in developing purpose-built rental. I've got a typo there, but we have about 500 rental units and we've built about 250 of those uh, purpose-built new in the last 10 years. Uh, the other is represented by uh, older stock, uh, typical stock in the West End and other areas of the city. Uh, we're inspired by, uh, by great design. We have design passion, construction innovation. We've won uh, numerous UGI awards for uh, housing innovation. And we were, as was mentioned, we were, we're particularly proud to receive the uh, most innovative company, BC Award, for our micro law project in the downtown east side, and that's going to be a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today, and Deb has indicated uh, that that is an emerging trend uh, even in New Westminster. Uh, so moving ahead here. By that. So why are we interested in building rental housing? Uh, as as uh, was mentioned before, in Vancouver, I think the statistic was 52% of the population are renters. We, so well over 50% anyway, are renters. This is a very, very large market in Vancouver, and it also was uh, referred to by Bev, um, typically in quite aging stock, uh, in stock that has uh, rising operating costs, is energy inefficient, and does not necessarily meet the current needs of the tenants. And they're living in them because they're, they're what's there, they're what's available for rental. And tenants are looking, in our experience, for more central locations, um, close to transit, in modern and modern suite conveniences, uh, even if that comes at the cost of less space. People are definitely willing to trade space for place and uh, live with less in terms of floor area if they can have more uh, modern conveniences and better locations. And this has got a lot to do with the fact that all the things we have have got smaller. When you think about televisions and telephones and stereo systems and uh, computers, uh, they're all much, much smaller things now, and it's, it's had a very interesting effect on the need for space. The other thing that's affecting uh, trading space for places, is we're very fortunate to live in some really great cities in, in Canada and a good climate, and so the outside your building has become a place that's very meaningful to a lot of people uh, in terms of amenities, cafes, restaurants, parks, sea walls, um, bike paths, these kind of things that are outside the four walls of your apartment have, have as the cities have continued to evolve and become better urban places, they offer you more and you don't need so much within your four walls to have a, to have a healthy uh, and happy lifestyle. Some of the rentals we built and uh, and, and you'll start to see the, the pattern. Uh, this is the renovation of the old spaghetti factory building in Gastown on Water Street, uh, 110,000 square foot heritage building that we converted to uh, rental uh, LibWork Studios in 2002. Uh, very popular, very successful, but to put it in context, these suites are in the range of 850 square feet. And uh, on the north side, they have water views, and they're right in a very popular Gastown. They're probably renting at over $2.50 a square foot, so they do represent a significant cost for a tenant, $1,700, $1,800 a month for a, you know, loft-style studio with, uh, with the uh, entitlement to work and live. But again, very popular type of, uh, type of building that's never had any vacancy. But after we built this building, and the next one I'm going to show you, what we noticed, this is uh, 33 Water, which is a purpose-built uh, straight rental, not live work building right next door to it on Water Street where the average suite size was about 700 square feet. Rents are probably even a little bit higher, uh, at, you know, 260 or 270 square foot. What we've noticed with these two buildings, although they've always done very well over the years, uh, they were both finished by 2004, is this constant uh, web-based inquiries through our marketing system for people who can say, 
are saying, I don't really mind where it is if it's long as it's in downtown, and I don't really mind how big it is, but I can only pay, you know, $700, $800, $900 a month, maybe $1,100 a month. And, you know, for every tenant that moved into these buildings, we saw 10 of those emails from people who, who were looking for a fundamentally different price point. Um, now, we do have, before getting to some of our responses, we do have challenges just in general to the creation of market housing, market rental housing, high land costs um, based on ownership values. So we have a strong culture in our society of home ownership. And built into home ownership is the expectation of increases in value over time. So homeowners, condominium owners, uh, are, are kind of built in and prepared to pay more for what they get because ownership comes with the prospect of future appreciation. So uh, that always puts a lot of pressure on land that could otherwise be used for rental. High construction costs, there's not much we can do about that except to try to use efficient design and, um, and modularity and typicality of suites to, to uh, cut down costs. Of course, urban design requirements imposed by cities, uh, particularly city of Vancouver, uh, increase costs. I'm not saying they're a bad thing, but you know the high, high design standards of uh, municipalities now, you know, also create costs in terms of the quality of materials and so on that you need to use. Uh, high municipal costs to finance growth. So in Vancouver, you've got uh, development cost levies, uh, which can be as high as eighteen, nineteen dollars a square foot. You have building permit fees, and in these zones, you have community amenity contributions, uh, which are uh, voluntary contributions that are that are offered to the municipality uh, when you rezone uh, property to increase the density. And as an example, we just did a strata project in Vancouver um, where the community amenity contribution equated to, uh, and the total city fees equated to $50,000 per suite. And long approval times are, are also an obstacle to uh, creating more affordable types of housing because the time at which you need to hold the land and wait for your permits puts pressure on the financial performance. One of our most significant issues uh, in Vancouver and, and, and other municipalities to a lesser degree are what, what I would call um, uh, you know, regulatory barriers. And uh, these are often very well intended, uh, sometimes outdated, coming from many different um, silos within municipal government. Uh, and some of them are um, minimum unit sizes. Uh, in Vancouver, you, can, you are not permitted without council variation of the bylaw to build a, an apartment below 398 square feet. And uh, I think you're going to see as I continue on here that, that, that you know, why that's an issue for us. Uh, prescriptive requirements regarding unit mix, uh, uh, i.e. the number of two and three bedroom units that are required to be built into a new project. These large units are very difficult, uh, particularly in towers, where they take up such, uh, because you have to have bedrooms on the outside walls, uh, they take up a lot of uh, space on the floor plate. and and it's hard to get them to be the right size and the proportion on the floor plate. So that's why you see a dearth of large units in, in the tower format. Um, inflexible guidelines related to borrowed light bedrooms. So it's really the same issue. If you want to build a three bedroom suite in a condominium, you could make one of the bedrooms a borrowed light bedroom quite easily and have a better and more uh, a compact unit, a three bedroom unit. But um, municipal guidelines around horizontal angle daylight and having direct sunlight into bedrooms um, can make that very difficult. Uh, parking requirements, and uh, it is the case that many municipalities are, are seeing now that they can significantly reduce parking requirements for rental housing. We find that even 10 years ago in Vancouver, the uh, market demand for parking and rental housing was about a half a stall per unit. And we now see in Vancouver, particularly with the changing demographics and the millennial uh, cohort, uh, an even lower demand than that. So I think municipalities uh, should continue to be very aggressive to try and reduce their parking requirements for rental. Uh, scarcity of zone land for efficient um, transit-oriented rental projects. Um, you know, neighborhood uh, uh, concerns, uh, uh, so NIMBY issues, and um, a sense of entitlement to low density around high high density. Uh, transit arterials um, has been a real problem in Vancouver. You can still stand around at numerous SkyTrain stations in Vancouver and get out and look around at the station and you'll see single family uh, dwellings on all four corners. Uh, that's, that's, you know, that's an absurd situation for us to be in um, after having, you know, invested uh, so much money in these transit. 
environmental systems. Uh, and so municipalities should be working harder to, to, to zone land around transit with some inclusionary requirements for uh, rental housing. In Vancouver, we have something called the Rate of Change Bylaw, some of which Bev was hinting at, similar policies in New Westminster, where a well-intended um, policy to prevent the loss of existing rental housing when creating new rental housing. And so in Vancouver, they have what they call a one-to-one -one replacement. But this, where you, if you if you if you build uh, a new building, new condominium or mixed use building, you have to replace at least as many rental units as you as you took away in the old building. And that sounds fine at first blush. Unfortunately, it's a policy that gets used politically to resist uh, replacement rental and to maintain lower quality aging stock uh, out of the concern that it won't be affordable. And I think this is a really key point when you're looking at. Um, municipal incentives to create rental stock. In Vancouver, there's been a lot of criticism of programs that have created rental stock because the particular new buildings that are created for rental may not be the cheapest. It's kind of like cars. You know, new cars are always more expensive than old cars, but if you flood the market with new cars, the cost of old cars is going to go down. But what happens with new rental buildings is they come on, they're brand new, they've got all the modern conveniences dishwashers, washer dryers, amenity spaces, gyms in the building, uh, great locations, and they are more expensive than the existing stock, but they add to the supply. And they're often criticized politically because people look at the particular building that's come online and say, look, it's not affordable. And they overlook the fact that, that, that the real purpose of these programs is to increase supply. And I'd like to, I'd like to see what Bev says about that maybe when we get to the end. Um, the Residential Tenancy Act is, is uh, you know, uh, again, well-intended legislation to protect tenants, but it does create um, severe economic obstacles to creating rental housing because uh, rent control increases, which are, are legislated by the by, by, by the Residential Tenancy Act, can radically um, be radically different than than the, the broader-based inflationary impacts on apartment buildings, such as property taxes. So, you might face a situation where your costs are rising by 6 or 7 percent, but because of the Residential Tenancy Act, you can't raise the rent beyond a certain uh, published percentage each year. So there's an element of rent control, uh, which, which um, I'm afraid discourages um, uh, investors from rental stock to some degree because they see more financial flexibility and, more, uh, and less uh, risk in other types of uh, development, particularly strata of ownership and or, and or office. Uh, there are taxation barriers to the creation of rental housing, um, federal. Uh, capital gains not being able to be reinvested and deferred when rolled into a new investment. There used to be a number of years ago that if you sold an investment property, you could, provided you did so within, I, I believe, one year, you could reinvest in another pro uh, rental property as long as you reinvested at least that amount and not trigger your capital gain. So now there's People who are sitting on older apartment buildings are loath to sell them and trigger the gain because they, they don't have an opportunity to shelter that capital gain by investing in a newer, larger apartment building to increase rental stock. Provincial basis, the property purchase tax, which is a which is a transactional tax that the government doesn't really add any value for to a given transaction, two percent of the property value, is a further discouragement and an increase in cost and, and pushes people towards higher yield models of real estate um, utilization because they've had to pay those costs to acquire the land. Uh, rentals are not are also not GST exempt, so built into the rental costs uh, of, of all rental housing are all the GST burdens on the underlying supplies like janitorial supplies and maintenance and so on. So the you know one thing the federal government could consider would be exempting uh, rental stock from uh, from GST and with the requirement that uh, that uh, landlords pass that saving on to the tenants. Now, in spite of all these obstacles, uh, we persevere, and uh, this is our current interest uh, is microhousing, and this is rooted in and kind of come back to my comments from before about what we saw with that continuous. Um, uh, unsatiated demand for people who could be in around $1,000 uh, uh, rate per month for their apartment. And this was a, a, a vacated, condemned uh, former single room occupancy hotel in the downtown east side at Hastings and Carroll right across from Pigeon Park. Um, as 
Bev has referenced, we were able to use uh, heritage incentives, which was uh, grants, uh, two facade grants of $50,000 each, um, a property tax holiday for 10 years, and a heritage identity transfer to move development rights off-site to rehabilitate this building and create 30 a rental micro lofts. The average size of these micro suites is 265 square feet. They range in size from 219 square feet to 291 square feet. And uh, when, these, when this building was completed about four years ago, it rented on Craigslist in one week with a zero uh, zero dollar uh, marketing budget. Uh, There's some renderings of the Burns Box micro lofts. Um, each suite has a full kitchen, a flat screen TV, a workspace, a wall bed that converts to a dining table, um, uh, came furnished, the wall bed included a mattress, and the rent included uh, cable vision and internet. The only additional charge to the tenant is their electrical consumption. There's no parking in the building. Uh, there's ample bike storage and a uh, shared laundry room and a rooftop deck and a rooftop social room. Uh, here's the uh, perspective with the wall bed down and with the bed up with the dining table down. This is, these are actual pictures of the unit. So that in this one, the completed unit, you see the very large heritage window looking out onto Maple Tree Square uh, area. Uh, high quality kitchen cabinets, um, high quality appliances, a workspace, a, a flat screen TV included. And looking back the other way, you see the wall bed. Uh, in, in the up position with the dining table also in the up position folded up against the uh, bed and then surrounding storage. And to the left is a uh, washroom with a glass wall so that the what is a very small washroom feels more spacious because the light comes in through the translucent glass. Uh, this is looking a different plan. Looking back at the kitchen uh, again with the workspace, all very high quality wood flooring throughout the suite. Um, and uh, very bright, very spacious, and high quality, efficient design. This is the washroom. Uh, the the washroom door, which is on the lower left, uh, actually uh, opens in and becomes the shower door uh, when you're using the shower. So it's a dual purpose door. Uh, well mounted vanity and compact, um, compact uh, sink and a wall mounted toilet wall on toilet to increase the sense of spaciousness and, and even the foot space uh, as you move around inside the unit. Um, so that's the kind of thing that we're doing and um, it's, it's remarkable to, to realize that that is a bit of a one-off, uh, a bit of a one-off project in the city of Vancouver and that they are now quite strongly resistant to us doing more micro law projects um, and, and have a whole set of kind of planning concerns related to that, which we're trying to work through. In the meantime, um, this demand is, is going on satiated. We did a uh, strata um, a micro law project in Victoria, and, and although it's not rental housing, I'm sure a lot of it will end up in rental. And that was a very soft market in Victoria, and our micro law project, we sold 120 units in about 10 days. So this is a very interesting area of housing that, that we, we feel needs to be gotten into more. Um, so I'm just going to, sorry, go back up there for a second. So what can we do to increase rental housing uh, supply? Um, of course, removal and reduction of these regulatory barriers, and in this particular instance, uh, the, uh, the regulation on minimum unit size uh, is making it difficult for us to do more micro long projects. Uh, we still see microloss as a kind of a niche portion of the market. It's not for everybody. It's for young people, millennials, uh, early in their working career. And also we see a lot of older people who are looking for a more simple lifestyle, downsizing, selling their principal residences, maybe putting cash in the bank and traveling more, uh, having an interest in this, in this category as well. So that was a big regulatory barrier for us. Uh, more pre zone land suitable for higher density rental projects. Uh, removal of rent controls and federal incentives. So, you know, those are all big apps. They've been things that have been talked about for many years and uh, they, the, the, the appetite for them comes and goes. Uh, this is another uh, microloft concept we have designed by Bing Tom, which we'd be proposing for the east side of Vancouver on East Hastings Street. Again, this would be purpose-built. 
uh, rental housing, we have no problem, as Bev indicated, signing a, uh, a rental-only non-strata covenant for the greater of 60 years for the life of the building. In this particular design here, the idea is that the balconies, by not being stacked and being kind of randomized across the vertical face of the building, uh, create this kind of um, vertical community where you can come out on your balcony and sort of be talking to people in an adjacent unit or a unit above. It's kind of an interesting uh, idea to increase social engagement within the building. Now, we currently have a um, proposal to the City of Vancouver to build a microloft tower. And uh, this could be part of our uh, fourth tower of our Burrard Gateway project, which we're doing, which impacts the development. Uh, and this building would be, I think, microloft on a whole new scale, where the whole building is designed from the ground up to be predominantly microloft. We have ranges. We have about 25% compact two-bedroom units and two different sizes of microloft in sort of high 300 square foot and low 300 square foot range. We are also proposing a, a um, component within the building of what we call nano loft, and a, a nano loft is between 200 and 250 square feet. Again, with all the requisite componentry in them, including dishwasher and washer dryer, full fridge, um, cooktop, wall oven, flat screen TV, wall bed, dining table, wood floors, full bathroom, and uh, going beyond the suite itself. We're looking to create significant amounts of amenity space in these buildings for use by the tenants who live in the microloft. Probably, well, a 100% increase over the typical amount of public amenity space uh, with redundancy. So one of the most important things there is uh, bookable dining rooms that link to outdoor spaces so that if you have, let's say, a family Christmas dinner, you can book one of these rooms and bring a caterer in or have a potluck dinner and use this room and, and then, you know, when you're done with the party, you clean up and you go back to your studio. Uh, study hall areas, child play areas, social rooms, um, music practice rooms, so that if you want to do something noisy like play guitar or practice your trumpet, you can go into an acoustically isolated music practice room. Um, so in this particular building concept, which is done by a very famous Los Angeles architect, Neil Denary, all those kind of notches and, and, and roof decks and openings in the building, every one of those things is, a, is some sort of a public space for all the tenants in the building, including the rooftop. So this is microloft on a grand scale, 375 units in a tower. And we see this as a, a, uh, you know, a requisite response to what we, what, what we believe is this incredible demand for millennials to live uh, live downtown to trade uh, space for place um, to take advantage of the common amenity areas of the building as well as the incredible public realm that Vancouver has in terms of public amenities and uh, cultural and, uh, and retail life. And this is what people want. And we're finding that it's, uh, it's a real challenge for planners and municipalities and uh, they've been concerned with uh, land speculation uh, concerns that this may sort of drive uh, condominium ownership into an even smaller unitized uh, uh, level that's going to inflate costs. So we've offered to do this building as 100% rental, but that still has not uh, moved the municipality off a kind of broad set of kind of non-specific angst about moving in this direction. Some uh, more perspectives on this building showing how it, it, it has openings and notches in it to create uh, public space for the tenants. There's a uh, patio space with, you know, a four-level void over top of it to, to make sure that there's lots of sun and, and light coming in. Grocery store on the main floor uh, so that tenants can buy uh, food right in the base of the building. There are some good programs in Vancouver that are promote, promoting rental housing. Um, much like Bev uh, was saying, uh, their rental programs here at Rental Housing, we have something in uh, Vancouver, it was called STIR, which is short-term incentives for rental. It's now called Rental 100. And what it does is it provides additional density uh, uh, in order to build purpose-built rental buildings with a 60-year covenant. Essentially, the city will allow you to rezone and increase the size of your building until it works for rental, until the rental pro forma works, um, and, the, and the landlord grants the covenant. Uh, interestingly, this, is a, this has been a very successful program in Vancouver. I think there's been several hundred units already created, and there's well over a thousand in the approval pipeline. 
but it's one of these policies that's being criticized because people are looking at the relatively higher cost of the brand new, uh, you know, highly highly amenity rich rental buildings that are being built, and criticizing them for for being uh, not at the mid or bottom level of the rental price spectrum, but that's where I think there's a misunderstanding of the intent of the program is to add supply. So yes, there are people who can afford to move up into less space and, and higher quality space in these buildings, but they're leaving behind a vacancy in the older stock, and that's where you know affordability starts to come in, is that people who can't yet afford a brand new uh, rental apartment can move into that vacancy left behind. Um, we also have, as, as I was referencing for our burn spot project, uh, heritage incentives, uh, which often uh, are able to be used to repurpose the heritage building uh, for rental use, which you know we call sort of playing a rental tune on a heritage fiddle. It's really using heritage incentives to make a rental building work in an existing building where those incentives aren't available for new construction. And uh, you know, I think. Two or three of the rental projects that we've done in Vancouver have been heritage building conversions, and even one of the ones Bev showed, if not two of the ones Bev showed, were doing that exact same thing using existing incentives for a different reason to to be able to make the rental performa work. So I'm going to leave it at that, and uh, just that our our desire as a developer is very strong to build rental housing. Um, we're looking at our forward our forward book of, of development work in the next five years and well over 50% of it is intended for rental use. Uh, but in every case, we're going to continue to need to rely on these various uh, municipal programs and hopefully uh, removal of municipal barriers to creating rental. And in our particular emphasis at the moment is on, on uh, allowing a, a, a larger entitlement for well-designed, uh, well-conceived compact units below 398 square feet. Thank you. Thank you, John, and thank you for that great presentation. Um, I really uh, appreciate the uh, maybe a bit of a philosophical conversation that I hear happening here, which is really about the, the culture change that we're experiencing now in our urban centers, and a lot of urbanists have commented, this, commented on this over the last uh, maybe decade, but really in the last few years about really challenging the notion of how much private space do we need when we have access to great public space. And I think, you know, John, you're definitely showing that um, you're out there building and challenging or putting that, that, that philosophical question into practice. So appreciate the presentation. Um, we've got a couple of questions right now uh, left on the table, but I also want to give uh, opportunities for any specific questions uh, that anybody has for John right away. Um, and maybe while we're waiting for that, uh, maybe I'll take the question that uh, John raised during his presentation for Bev and, uh, and maybe, you know, give Bev an opportunity to respond to that. And if I recall correctly, it was really a question about, you know, is, is, uh, you know, is providing supply enough or do we need to provide affordable housing supply? And, uh, you know, interested to hear uh, Bev's thoughts on that. Sure. Thank you for that question. It's a really interesting question. Uh, when we went um, when we uh, went to develop the secured market rental housing policy, we were actually quite clear up front that this policy was about increasing supply. It's about taking the long view, and in that you know that we need to replace the stock, the stock that we're going to, to lose. The question of affordability, the, you know, came up a few times, but uh, we um, have a companion document, which is our affordable housing strategy, which has a whole host of um, initiatives to, to address affordability more directly. So I think quite unabashedly, we see our secured market rental housing policy as about increasing supply. Um, we know that if there were other tools that came along, we could drill down to the affordability part uh, you know, with, with certain partners, with nonprofit groups, but really this policy is about supply, so I would agree, agree strongly with what John said. Great. Okay. So I guess I'd like to follow up with the next question that we had. This is uh, from Bev's presentation. It was uh, from the City of Victoria, and really they're asking uh, the servicing requirements, uh, what servicing requirements have you relaxed or do you see as being uh, options to relax. Sure. 
And that actually has been a challenging part of this. There's a, you know, servicing, a lot of servicing requirements are incredibly basic. You know, you have to provide water and sewer. That goes without question. Uh, you know, for us, you know, things such as replacing sidewalks are really important, especially with regard to an aging population and, and accessibility. So in many cases, it came down to things such as underground wiring. Um, you know, we have our own utility here, and we might have a bit more flexibility, but in, in certainly in one case, uh, the decision was made not to require that the, the wiring go underground. So that's, you know, a, a real example. Great. Thank you for that. And I guess we have a question. Um, it's probably similar to what we've just talked about for uh, John, but it's, do you ever get criticism that your rental units are not affordable? And um, I know you've talked a bit about this, but how, how do you respond to that uh, comment? Uh, John, you might be muted. We're uh, we're not getting. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah. Let's see what's happening here. Firstly, uh, the comment I made already, which is that the intention of creating these new rental supplies is not necessary to that the new buildings be the cheapest thing you can find. You know, you may find that, like, you know, I'll come back to the car example, you know, a new car is always going to be more than a used car, but when you buy a new car, there's a used car out there for somebody else. So, yes, people might say they're not affordable for them, but looking even uh, more kind of formulaically, certainly in Vancouver, it's been uh, published and acknowledged by municipal uh, government and uh, social planning uh, parts of, of local government that, 30% of your gross income is a is a reasonable um, contribution to uh, to your housing cost, and at you know a median income of forty five thousand or forty six thousand dollars, I think Vancouver, and that's probably a bit of an old statistic now. Thirty percent would allow you eleven hundred and fifty dollars per month to to pay, and that would that would get you into a um, a typical uh, micro suite uh, on a rental basis, and uh, so it, it does fall within that 30% affordability matrix for many people. And the problem with this whole thing of affordability is it gets used as sort of kind of, you know, kind of hysterically to create this reactionary response that, that something's not affordable. But um, even if you look at the CMHC, what are housing? It's called the Hills Rate, which are housing income levels, which are are what CMHC determines to be the kind of um, sustainable uh, housing costs uh, uh, for a healthy uh, a financial life for people across different spectrums in the housing market. A lot of this, uh, a lot of these rates are, are not too different than what we're talking about here. So I think when we talk about affordability, we have to be quite specific about what we mean. We also talk about housing attainability. If you earn thirty, forty, fifty, sixty, one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year, there's an amount by which you should be not exceeding. Uh, your, a share of your income for housing. And so a family who's making eighty or $90,000 a year on a combined basis or $120,000 um, still has housing problems in, uh, in our market in terms of rental and ownership. And this one thing I didn't mention before is there have been some really significant improvements in Vancouver there with laneway housing, where um, small families can live on laneway housing ground-oriented in, a, in, a, in, a, in an area close to good schools and uh, more suitable for children. And uh, you could probably be renting a laneway house for a very high quality laneway house in the west side of Vancouver for eighteen to two thousand dollars, eighteen hundred to two thousand, maybe twenty two hundred dollars a month. So affordability is not the same thing for all people. Um, and yes, the criticism is there, um, and it's it's used, you know, like quite unfairly uh, in a lot of cases as 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 an uh, as an opposition to rental housing in the guise of affordability being the problem, but with the real issue being not wanting change or new development in the neighborhood. Thank you. And maybe I'll just take one more question here in the interest of time. And uh, it's really for both of our presenters. It's about the, uh, you know, when you look at New West and uh, the, the type of housing policies it has in place, they're, you know, quite complex and complementary for a larger urban center. And I know John's spoken about the policies that Vancouver has in place. And, you know, Vancouver is also very large and complex and has a very, you know, a system that's well-designed and put in place or, you know, 
but I, I think what, what is the advice that both of you would provide to smaller local governments looking to put in place, uh, you know, policies or tools to encourage rental housing? Okay. I'll, should I start first? Oh, sure. Uh, and, um, you know, New Westminster is a really small department. Um, in terms of the housing planning expertise, that would be me, um, you know, on my spare time, literally. Um, one thing we did have, and I have to say that it was so important, is we had political support and a strong political will to move forward with this initiative. And, in fact, one of our council members was doing work on rental housing and his educational studies, and um, it went a long way in, in getting the support to move forward. So that's important. Um, secondly, is we um, we like to do our research and base our policy on good information. And even though we're a small municipality, we look out to to lessons from others. Uh, in in this case, particularly Vancouver was extremely helpful. Our friends at Metro Vancouver were extremely helpful. So they, you know, we learned a lot from them. There's a lot of shared experiences. So you know, for from. Um, for, for us, that was important. And thirdly, consultation is we involved oh, people in the community interested in affordable housing and interested in rental housing. We involved UDI in the development of this policy, and they gave us some fantastic feedback about where the greatest benefits could be made. So there's my advice. Thank you, John. Uh, yeah, um, I mean, I'm cert certainly you know more of an urban urban developer. And, and and don't have a, a lot of knowledge on suburban, but uh, and smaller municipalities. But one thing I do know about about moving further out from the core of the region is that land cost becomes a smaller and smaller part of the equation. Uh, in Vancouver, uh, land cost in any development can be 33 percent to 40 percent of the total cost of the project, even more sometimes up to 50 percent. Uh, in New West, it's probably 10 to 15 percent. And in further municipalities out into the valley, it's probably an even lower proportion. So I would expect that if uh, rural or, or, or more distant suburban municipalities are looking to create uh, rental housing, they should be focusing on those areas uh, that affect the cost of the developer, um, such as uh, uh, servicing costs, um, road costs, riparian setbacks, uh, landscaping costs, things, things that would uh, have a, a disproportionate effect on, on construction costs because the land, frankly, is just not that big a part of it. Of course, if land could be granted or gifted or leased at a low cost, that would, that would help. But, um, again, it's, it's, it's a, it's a fairly, fair, fairly small part of the total cost spectrum of development in a suburban market. Great. Okay. Well, and thank you for that. And, uh, so first of all, I'd like to thank again our presenters today, uh, John, and Beth, great presentations, great answer, uh, questions and answers. I'd also like to thank our audience uh, for their questions and for joining us today on this call. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, I'd like to remind you uh, this webinar is eligible for 1.5 PIBC Organized and Structured Learning Credits. So if you're a planner, make sure you fill in uh, your online forms. Uh, the final fall webinar this year is going to be on November 27th. And we're going to be focusing on community resistance to infill and densification, so uh, a whole talk on NIMBY. And once again, your feedback is valued, and I think Josh is going to tell you a little bit more about how to fill out the survey. Yeah, thanks again, everyone. On behalf of the Economic Development Division, we're so pleased that you were able to join us today and, uh, and talk about, you know, housing, which is fundamentally a such an important part of a region's economic development. Uh, in terms of a survey, you'll be receiving one. Uh, if you haven't already, all, uh, haven't already received it, uh, you should be getting one. It only takes about two to five minutes, and it really does help us figure out uh, where the best value is in these webinars, um, how well they're received, and how we can make them better so that you can learn even more for future webinars. Um, as Roger uh, said, the, the next webinar is on November 27th, and um, everyone who attended this webinar, uh, you'll be receiving an invitation for that probably in the next week or two, um, along with uh, all the rest of our stakeholders. So uh, if there's no other questions or comments, I think we'll sign off for today, and thank you very much for joining us. Cheers. Cheers.